Hello again and welcome to Focus. Pakistan is in the international media spotlight amid reports that Western militants are being trained there by Al-Qaeda and other groups. It's attracted much attention and the story caught even more momentum as it was reported that suspected German militants were killed in a US drone strike last week. It's also believed that Western intelligence agencies recently scuppered a Pakistan-based plot to attack targets in France, Britain and Germany. But what attracts a Western national to travel to Pakistan's tribal belt and how worried should Western authorities and populations actually be about this development? In a moment, we'll take a closer look at those issues, but first we'll play you this report from our team in Pakistan. They went to a Quranic school in Karachi that's considered by some as a breeding ground for would-be militants. Karachi's Binoria Madrasa is renowned the world over. Young Muslims from Europe and elsewhere come here to receive ultra-conservative Islamic instruction. 3,000 students of 25 different nationalities, between the age of 8 and 21, live here. Their days are spent studying the Quran's verses. Students come here from all around the world, even the United States. Members of our organization who live abroad are in charge of recruitment. If the candidates are criminals, we refuse to take them. But if they're children from troubled backgrounds, corrupted by alcohol or Western society, and their parents want us to take them, well, we train them up, but it's not about making terrorists. Armed combat is nonetheless an integral part of their moral and spiritual training. On the Binyora Madrasa's official website, Jihad and the fight against Western influence are promoted openly. Infidels corrupt our children with their movies, their music and through the internet. Our enemies' children are trained to use weapons. Why shouldn't we teach our children to use Kalashnikovs? We were not authorized to meet with the British, American and French citizens who study here, but the head of the madrasa assures us that it operates transparently. We give any information concerning our students to Western consulates. It turns out that this measure concerns only a minority of the students. If the student also holds a Pakistani passport, he's free to go anywhere unmonitored. The UK's Deputy High Commissioner in Pakistan refuses to believe dual citizens pose a potential threat. The envoy prefers to use more diplomatic language. I do think they can be um, ambassadors or at least a point of contact between uh, us and Pakistan. I think they help in mutual understanding of each other's countries, the fact that they uh, travel backwards and forth, that there's some sharing of culture, of, of um, perspective, is, is helpful to both the UK and to Pakistan. Nasir Mahmoud is an architect. Born in Pakistan, he has been working in London for the past 20 years. He's British, Pakistani and a practicing Muslim. For him, the dual citizenship is not the issue. We follow only one book, which is Holy Quran, in, in the complete book. If they can find out one script, which, um, which mention or which give you that sort of direction to do any, any harm to other people. And that is something you will never find, especially toward if you look at uh, uh, suicide bombers. They cannot be Muslim because in, in Islam, this is absolutely haram, which is absolutely forbidden. Tonight, Nessia Mehmud will land in London. He's one of 500,000 dual citizens of the UK and Pakistan to make the trip each year. He'll go through immigration as a British citizen, hoping he can prove wrong those who view him suspiciously. Joining us now for more is Jonathan S. Paris. He's from King's College London, where he specializes in studying radical movements and how they attract followers. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Paris, for being to us today here at France 24. Let me first ask you this. How worried should European authorities be about Western nationals traveling to Pakistan and perhaps attending the kind of madrasas that we just saw in this report? Well, I think uh, Western authorities need to be concerned. Uh, the madrasas themselves are not the problem. The problem is the, uh, the angry young men or students here that, who go to the madrasas already alienated from their societies. And then when they're over there, they get the extra training 
and the motivation to become terrorists. It's not the madrasas themselves that do all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the actual training camps and al-Qaeda training camps that are really the harmful element. But you say that there is a real risk that some of these young men, some of the students at these madrasas could travel to the north of Pakistan where they receive training from al-Qaeda and other militant groups. There is a real risk there. Yeah. Yes, to the areas in between, next to Afghanistan in the northwest, the so-called frontier areas. And of course, the madrasas can be a, a, a conveyor belt uh, to that. And by the way, Karachi is a very, very large city, 16 and a half million people. And it wouldn't surprise me if there were radicalizing camps right in Karachi. So let's not be hung up about having to go to a certain area of Pakistan. Karachi is plenty large enough to, uh, to enable a lot of people, young people, to become terrorists. Now, you spoke before about alienation. Do you think that's the number one reason why some Western nationals, Muslim Western nationals, travel to Pakistan and perhaps go to the north of uh, Pakistan, excuse me, to, to receive training? Well, alienation is a big word. I think Marx coined it. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why someone becomes uh, alienated. It could be, or becomes uh, part of a, a terrorist group. It could be social reasons, it, it's the cool thing to do, uh, or it could be ideological. Uh, it could be angered, uh, not getting a job because you feel you're Muslim. So there's a variety of issues that happens, but the key to understanding terrorism is that angry young men do not explode themselves in British and German cities. It is those who, who go and travel to uh, areas of Pakistan where they receive that reinforcement, that motivation, and that training that turns an angry young man into a terrorist. Would you say that this is a growing problem? Are more and more people becoming radicalized in this kind of way? I'm not sure what the trend lines are right now, but this phenomenon has been with us since 7-7. You have to understand 7-7, which is the uh, 2005 July bombing of the, tube station, of the tubes and the bus in, in London that killed over 50 people. But you have to understand, before 7-7, before, uh, people were allowed to go abroad to fight in Kashmir or to fight against the Soviets in Afghanistan or, or to fight uh, in Bosnia. They were, it was considered by security forces here as a pressure valve to release these um, not so positive people abroad to do their own fighting, as long as it didn't harm Britain. But you see, 7-7 showed that uh, there was a blowback, that people could come back to Britain, as happened with Mohammed Sadiq Khan, who pre did precisely that. He started in Britain, trained in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and came back to Britain to lead the 7-7 uh, bombing. So you see, things have changed since 7-7. For the last five years, we've had this problem of homegrown terrorism. Homegrown terrorism is a big problem. Mm -hmm. It's not al-Qaeda seeking uh, ter terrorists here. It's angry young men here going to Pakistan, as you said, one of the 500,000 people who travel every year back and forth, and going to get to al-Qaeda camps to get that extra training. And that, that is the real danger. All right, uh, Jonathan S. Paris from King's College London, thanks very much indeed for speaking to us. And with that, we're going to wrap up Focus this time around. It's been a pleasure to have your company, and do stay with us. We have more news coming your way soon.